question is this. Is it legal for a federal agency to create a nonprofit corporation and then funnel money into that nonprofit corporation when they are not eligible to receive that contract? Is that a legal thing? And if IHS can do it, so can housing, so can Department of Justice, so can education. They all can follow the lead of IHS. And where is that gonna put all of us? And I say all of us, I mean the tribes, I mean our community up here, where is it gonna put all of us? You see what has happened to us with IHS, what they have done with this illegal and invalid contract. They have hurt our people here really, really bad. Very, very badly. Our people are being hurt here physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. You have heard only just a handful, and I have given you only just a handful of affidavits of harm. We have 10 of them, and they're not even some of these. We have 10 affidavits of harm in our case, in our federal case, and now we are going to the Supreme Court. Rosebud, we really could use your help if you would sign on with us in our Supreme Court case against the Indian Health Service. And I'm extending that invitation to Oglala Sioux Tribe and to Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Pull your resolutions and join us in our lawsuit at the Supreme Court level. We have to do this pro se. I live on Social Security. My friends, one lost her job. Another one has a family to support. We do this pro se. Julie is the researcher, Donna is the editor, and I'm the writer. None of us are lawyers. I'm just a scientist, that's all I am. But we know how to read, we know how to research, and it's our love for our people. All of our people, not just here in Rapid City, but all of our relatives on all these reservations also. Because as an older person who's been around a long time and looking at things and praying about things and everything. If we don't stop this, very, very many bad things are gonna keep coming to us. Healthcare is our treaty right, our treaty right. Someone asked me about if they destroy those buildings up there, then who has to pay to get them fixed? Federal government, it's our treaty right. That belongs to IHS. IHS set up this whole big mess and IHS needs to be responsible for cleaning it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before Michelle, I have uh, Ms. Cecilia Haas wants to, to say a few words. And then we'll go with Michelle and her PowerPoint. Thank you for giving me the time to do this. Um, I am a, a, tr a new transplant here to Rapid City. I came from Kyle. I'm an enrolled member of the, o the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. My family comes from the Potato Creek area. My grandmother was Lucinda Swimmer from Potato Creek, and that's where my mom was in the area there. But I just recently moved the in, end of September to Rapid City. In the process of moving, I had injured myself and I had brought papers with me and I was told from Kyle, the IHS system in Kyle, they said, go to the IHS system up there at Susan. Well, I know where that is. Okay, I'll do that. I registered, I put all my paperwork at IHS and then they said, well, you have to be referred. Referred? Where am I going? They said, well, you have to go here. So I take paperwork there. Well, no, you've got to take your paperwork over there. I ended up going to three buildings, three different people, and every time they opened up their computers, it was different. They didn't share the same system. Now I hear people in here say, I don't like IHS. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't care. You need to help us. You need to help us go through the system. I fell in a hole. I fell in a deep hole and the response was, well, you gotta get yourself out because we can't do anything for you. I had injured myself in the process of moving. I was told on December 24th that somebody, was, somebody from Oyate was going to call me and refer me. Well, look at where we are. This is the end of March. 
Did I get that phone call? No, I did not. I did not get that phone call. I am paying for this process now out of my own pocket. And just like she was saying, I live on Social Security, but I fell into that hole and I can't get out because Oyate says, you didn't get this, you didn't get that. <clears throat> so I finally get my eyes checked on February 24th. This is number four person now. She pulls up my records and she's going to get my, get my information for, uh, for my eye exam. And guess what she finds? Nothing. She finds my old records. I, like I said, I went to three buildings, three different people in Oyate, and the fourth person pulls up old systems, old records. I am an educator, a retired educator, a retired administrator. If I ran my schools the way this system is run, guess what? The schools would fail, I would be out of a job, our teachers would be out of a job because I didn't do my job. I have sent two letters to Miss Church over here. Did I hear a response? No, I did not. I finally, I've got this letter here. This is my second letter. I finally gave it to Shirley and said, this is why I'm complaining about this. Our people need help. We come to this system for help. Do we get the help? No. I finally told one person, I said, I've been to three people. I'm, I've given you everything I can give you except my body and it's broken and you won't fix it. And she looked at me and she says, well, that's not my job. So, like I said, I'm paying for this out of my pocket. I don't wanna hear that you don't like this. I don't wanna hear that you're transparent. I don't wanna hear any of that. I wanna see our people being helped. And I know as an elder, I'm almost 76 years old and we need help. We need the system to help us. We need your help. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ms. Haas. Um, Michelle. First of all, did anybody find the earring? I lost it. It's blue, it has sitting bowl on it. Um, if you find it, could you please return it? It was a gift. Um, anyway, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michelle Belt. I'm an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe, born and raised in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Um, and also, um, I have 30 years of experience um, and like mostly everybody sitting around this table. Um, also utilizing the IHS system, so I know it very well. Um, and my other big accomplishment was I worked for Spirit Lake as their CEO and helped them transition from IHS to tribal. We got that done within three years. By the time I left, we were fully accredited by AAAHC. We had our revenue generation going. Um, so I know all well how it is to um, transition from uh, I just to tribal. One of the biggest things um, that I see that has not happened was um, the complaints. And I know I have a PowerPoint, but and, and I'll talk about that too. Um, but that was one of the biggest issues that I, I, I seen was um, when you first got there, you heard all of the complaints. And so when I took the job as the compliance officer um, in working with this project, I was really excited because I had that background and I thought, this is really awesome that our tribes are are taking this speed on because we can do it you know i'm here to tell you that it can be done um, we're making it harder than it has to be um, first of all whenever you listen to people and you hear their pain you do whatever you can to help them today you don't worry about whatever committees out there whatever deals out there you stop what you're doing and you help your people not tomorrow not next year right now because everybody has some type of insurance. And in taking this on, we should have all understood that um, Susan had an ER, then it went away, then they changed to urgent care. Well, most of your cases that are truly ER are, are like 2%. The rest of them do belong in urgent care. 
And if we're able to get everybody health insurance, um, you should be able to get them the care that they need right now. So I'm listening to a couple of the people in the audience and I did offer to them before because I'm a strong advocate for people. Um, I don't need to be paid, but I know I can help them maneuver through their system and because it's complicated. I've been in this for 30 years. It's still complicated for me. And I just would also like to say that I'm very happy to be walking today um, because there is no consistency, continuity of care at OHC. Whenever I came in, I'm lucky that I know my own body, my own health, what insurance I had. So I'm going to tell my story because just like everybody else here, it is true. Um, the case managers, people are leaving their left and right because they're not being heard, they're not happy. Um, so with me, um, I had insurance luckily. So I went to Dr. Rico who, she worked for Rosebud, she was a pain management doctor there. And so I met her, she was, we were doing injections and then all of a sudden the issue became my back. And so by that time, I was also an employee at um, Great Plains. Um, and before I got terminated there, I was getting my health care through insurance. And so I was in so much pain. They referred me out. I got a shot. It didn't work. And so I was just in so much pain. I was like, man, there has to be something else out there. How, you know, what can I do? And so then I, um, I looked online and then all of a sudden Black Hills Orthopedic Urgent Care popped up. And I said, wow. And so then I, I went over there. I was really in pain, but I went over there. Um, within the, by the end of the week, I was in surgery because it was that bad. Um, but nobody at OHC knew that. Um, I talked to my, my supervisors and let them know I'm in some severe pain. I was calling in almost every day trying to get a shot so I could work. Um, and at that time, I, I don't know if they understood that because I, I mean, for me as an employee, I work really well um, with people and then I always try to keep my direct supervisor informed about me and how, you know, so that they understand where I come from. But it seemed to me like they were a little bit, um, they, to me, it seemed like they, it, it, it just didn't work for them. They, they didn't like me telling them those kind of issues. Um, so I took my own care into my own hands. Um, and I met Dr. Gaffney um, and Rebecca at Black Hills Ortho. And so they performed four different surgery and for surgeries. And so today I'm very lucky to be walking. So I, I really am happy that I'm here, but I'm also here to tell you that it can be done. And so now I'm gonna do my presentation because I feel um, me, for me that you guys need to know as the compliance officer for Great Plains, I did do my job. I was working, I did go to work every day in pain, but I still did my job. I did a lot of work. Um, and the crazy thing is when I got there, I didn't know that, that they had hired a consultant and that consultant is Tim. So, um, so I started working with him and who gets fired when you have a consultant? Whenever you're working with your supervisor and she says, um, I said, okay, well, this is what we're gonna do. And she told me herself that she didn't know anything about compliance, so she didn't know how she was gonna supervise me. So I said, okay, well, I'll learn it and I'll give you stuff and then we'll learn together. But uh, she, then I said, so can we have a year to do that to get everything into place? So she agreed to that. So at 90 days, I did my evaluation. I put everything in there. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it in phases. Then we're gonna also do, I'm gonna sign up and I'm gonna become a certified compliance officer because I found a class to do that. So we said, okay, well, guess what? I never got an evaluation. 90 days came and went, 120 days came and went. I became permanent, but I still had no evaluation. So I got terminated at will for no cause. And I was like, geez, you know, that ain't good. They didn't even meet with me in person. I was sick that day. I called in, they sent me an email. I was terminated. I was like, oh my God, you know, don't you, you know, that to me, that's not right. And working with people um, and you're the top, it shouldn't be that way. You should be able to sit down with somebody on your executive team who knows your, your, how your program runs, how people come with all the complaints. You should be able to sit down with them and say, hey, this is, these are the issues that we're having and at least give me the opportunity to improve. But anyway, so that's my story short in there. But I wanted to show you, um, I wanted to show you my work because um, in, looking, in, in looking at the, um, so my experience as a, a compliance officer for Great Plains, um, and I'm not angry about it. I don't want my job back. 
Um, but I think that because there's three tribes here, I just want you to know that compliance is a big issue um, in healthcare. And I have created the program, developed it. It has never come to you guys for approval. Um, and according to how they're set up now, it's not going to, you're never gonna see these documents, but they should be in place. Um, so they are out there. I didn't give you a copy of my presentation or the work that I've done. Um, but if you want that, um, it'll also be good for IHS. Cause like I said, I work for IHS too. Um, so I have a lot of contacts out there, people that I worked with <clears throat> that helped me um, write some of this stuff in, in, in looking at the work, but also with Tim, of course. So my, my saying is absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's been almost three years since OHC has been in place. You guys shouldn't have to hear these problems. These problems should be handled by the people that work at the lowest level possible. These patients should not be in collections for sure. They shouldn't have to go through that because you're already sick. You're going there to be helped uh, with PRC. Um, it shouldn't be that way. If you have a approved purchase order, they should be sending a document with that to say, you cannot send these people to collections. You cannot go after them. Under the 638 law, there is a clause in there and they should know that. So that was ha that happened to me too, but I did let Tori know, or yeah, let her know that you need to let these um, other entities, Monument Health, whoever you're dealing with, you need to let them know that they shouldn't be going after people like that. And they definitely shouldn't be ending up in court. So I was hired in July of 2019, like I said. Um, I engaged with the consultant group to start um, compliance. Created a compliance program from square one. Um, conducted initial audits. Developed interim steps. Created a code of conduct. Developed the operational plan developed training program for staff and new hires. Barrier in my barriers to success for the code of conduct. Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board Leadership Administration, not the 19 tribes, uh, tribal chair, um, presidents, but the leadership administration rejected the initial code of conduct in November, 2019 and requested revisions. Revisions presented to leadership on January 10th of 2020 Revisions reflected every change requested by leadership. Leadership never approached the code of conduct or approved the code of conduct, unable to train staff on code of conduct due to non-approval. Still more uh, barriers to success here. Engaged with Navix Global to implement an electronic reporting process for compliance concerns. Submitted proposal to use same process for patient complaints was never approved by leadership. Revised code of conduct was never put into the NAVIC system. Implemented reporting system without code of conduct. So this is a screenshot, which is still in place today and it's live. I'm not sure if they're still using it, but this is the system that I went out there, um, worked with HR um, and we worked with other, there was other companies that um, use the system. And so we decided to go with, um, with this one, but this is the screenshot of Great Plains is NAVEC system where the employees could file a report um, and they could do it anonymously if they want to. And the reason you want to do that is because there's a lot of people that are fearful of retaliation. So they would want to do something anonymous. So this is part of my compliance um, training and it was called the compliance hotline. And so if we clicked on that or there's a number, somebody else on the outside is actually um, running the program. So we wouldn't take the initial complaint with that. They would take the complaint, they would put it into the system. I would get an email notification that there was a concern in there. <clears throat> I would go in there, look at it. If it was HR concern, I would send it over to HR, have them look at it. If it was a different type of concern, then we would send it to that individual for them to do the investigation. And then from there, it would be documented that it was complete. And these are the compliance documents. Um, the first one is a status report to leadership. Uh, the last one that I completed whenever I left.
So it's basically my report that went to Sonny, who was my direct supervisor after. Um, um, Geraldine said she wouldn't be able to supervise me. She didn't understand compliance. And, and I put up a fight because I didn't think I should be under Sonny um, either. Um, initially, your compliance officer should be with your board. Um, but because there was no board in place and you have the advisory committee, um, the compliance officer is pretty much just tucked away now. And, and who has since in that position has been filled with a non-native, which is um, not right either. Right here. Okay, so the next one is a code of conduct. These are really long documents. And if I would have printed out my report to give you, it probably would have been about 200 pages per person and I didn't want to waste paper. Um, so I didn't do that. If you guys want a copy of these documents um, for your own use or, or for somebody else to use, that's fine. I, I don't mind sharing this stuff because it was never approved by Great Plains or never went anywhere after um, it was submitted to the leadership. Um, I don't mind sharing my work. Let's just put us back to the PowerPoint. Okay, but I just, I, I for me, I just felt like um, I wanted you guys to know that I was doing my work and contrary to what's being said about me, I really am a hard worker. I pay attention to detail um, and I'm not afraid to get up and, and uh, resolve issues. Um, and so this one is a compliance operational plan. And this is the actual plan um, that you would, you would put in place, the makeup of your, um, your committee, how you're gonna do business. Um, and for some reason, I'm sorry, but these, docu that these documents aren't coming up. But this compliance flow chart, I wish that one com would come up because it would actually explain to you what compliance is and how you would utilize that within your facility. And then this one, this is an escalation policy. You ain't gonna see this in too many areas, but this escalation policy needs to be put in place. So that would say, you ever have a complaint on your top person or your CEO, then that policy helps escalate that issue to your board because how, the, how it's set up now, um, Geraldine has absolute control. She sees everything from the beginning to the end. So she'll come and she'll sit in those committee meetings and they'll have a discussion. They'll make a decision there. It'll follow through the process. It'll get to their executive committee, to the advisory board. And then they make the decision again, it goes nowhere. The tribes don't see any of that. And from my understanding, you guys have received a report that was a one page document. When I did my report, it was 52 pages to the Spirit Lake tribe because I put every single department in there and it showed the revenue that was generated, how many patients we've seen, if there were any complaints in there, everything. And so I guess for me, that that's not good. You guys need to have a bigger report than what's been given to you, that's for sure. And so the compliance program was fully developed but like I said, I was terminated before I was able to um, actually do the full presentation to her because. And so for me, um, I, I'm going to say I'm, I was also a whistleblower to the OST Council. Um, because I witnessed the retaliation, the demotion, the improper termination of others, the bullying actually in a meeting, um, <clears throat> which Gerilyn was chairing, um, and she allowed Sonny to be a bully which I experienced that. Geraldine did nothing, she just put her head down. So I asked to be excused from that meeting because I knew nothing was gonna happen there. And the hiring practices, Indian preference is not practiced. You take a look at all of the positions, the administrative positions, those, a lot of them were filled with non-natives. That's not right. We have so many people, we're capable, we're smart, we're resilient, we're able to learn. You can teach people, you can build career ladders. So I don't understand that. Within this Indian organization, should be all native. 
Why do we have non-natives working? We have 28,000 Native Americans working in Rapid City. We're unemployed with education. That's sad. Like I said, there's no escalation structure to get complaints to the OST and CR CRST councils without being terminated for um, insubordination, if that's what she's claiming. Um, and then there's also federal whistleblower protections extended to Title I contractors, if you guys didn't know that. Um, we're entitled to use the OIG hotline also to um, report any issues that may be going on within the organization. And Great Plains also has a whistleblower protection clause in their employee handbook, but they do not follow it. And a lot of people don't feel, I mean, I guess I felt safe to come to the OST council with these protections, because at that time, Julian was the president. Um, so I was able to talk with him about a lot of different issues. And they weren't, I mean, my issues are not personal with Geraldine. My issues are about the structure and how to make it better for the people so that we get good care. So that there's um, just a foundation or you know a structure within that, so the complaints are heard, you know, so people could resolve them, and not just one person has absolute power and everybody has to be scared of her. Excuse me, so Ms. I, Belt. Yeah. Um, this is very important information, and I know a lot of people are probably interested in it, but we're kind of pushed on time here, so appreciate it if you could. Well, this is what kind of, I'm getting to the last of my, my presentation. Thank you. Um, so like I said, I went to Julian um, and shared the information with him. And he actually called Geraldine and told her to set up a meeting with all the employees. She never did that. And then I did, I did get a, doc, a binder for him, um, but he was suspended. And so that kind of went there. So I talked with Mr. Greenwald about how this organization was supposed to be set up. And he said that there was supposed to be a board in place and that Great Plains and that Geraldine and Sonny were not supposed to be directly supervising OHC. So I think that really needs to be looked into. So now that you have seen that, like I said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Thank you for your time. And I thank everybody for coming and listening. And please, you guys need to do something because um, it really isn't working the way it should be. And, and you guys can do that. And I think if you take a look at the elderly set up on how, it, you know, how the board should be there, the makeup of that board, um, and people listening to the complaints, I think you'll have better success that way. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Mr. Zimiga. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is just give a little synopsis of what I've heard and probably put it into, encapsulate it into what we should, what I think to give you something to think about. In listening here today, I see the tribal councils within it, they have a responsibility as well as the community, as well as IHS, as well as the state of South Dakota, is because they all have fiduciary responsibilities to spend money correctly. And in doing that, if you think about this, this is what I heard. The caption is, the Golden Fleecy by IHS to purposely disenfranchise and disinherit the Native people of South Dakota of quality health care. This lady that in all of them presenting the issues here those are statements that are coming out that are people both physically and mentally in needing of health care. But also the organization is hanging on to putting a cost to tribes. IHS is fleecing the people here again. And so it's your choice. 
in serving as a commissioner of Indian Affairs, if I was asked by the governor what I thought, that's, that's what I would tell him. And also, with, when you do not use fiduciary responsibilities, they can look into that and saying, okay, who is responsible? And that becomes the RICO Act, because not every American dollar has a serial number on it. Every process has a way in which to expend that. And if you're touching, in some way, utilizing it, and not saying anything when you see something that is not right, you become part of it. So I just wanted to reiterate that. I think that there's enough within this council and what I've heard, heard is that you have the data right there. You have data that was presented that you could use together to build a good, responsible case against Indian Health Service because they falsely misled you. In, in doing that, what you have is the whole idea that it is an important to care for somebody's health when you have a responsibility through enactment of a law, and that's the 1851 and 1868 treaty. We are the only people that have that intended reasons why we should have quality health care. So if you don't think you're part of the fleecing, Believe me, you should, you should have had a camera here or could have been taking this whole thing and used it as evidence. I think we need to protect our, our native people and our tribes and people we do business with to carry them out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zimiga. So we, uh... We had a lot of people come up and voiced their concerns and a lot of questions. Um, I think we're going to allow Miss Church, hopefully she was taking notes and has a, a lot of um, written down a lot of the, the questions and concerns that that were brought forth. Uh, Miss Church will give you the floor. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is just address a, just a few of the topics that were raised today, but I think what really needs to happen is um, another um, opportunity for the health board to fully present to all three councils a full um, report on, um, on OHC and the, and the um, the, um, the resolutions, the contracts, it was just a tremendous amount of uh, misinformation that was presented today, but there was also some really important valid points um, and frustration that I actually um, share, um, especially when it comes to the issue of coordinating PRC and um, coordinating um, healthcare and systems, not talking to one another. Um, and, um, you know, we share those concerns and we share those frustrations because we've had to try to navigate them. And this system, it was a, is a system that was not designed by us, but rather that we inherited. Um, you know, I, again, I wanna reiterate that um, the, the contract, um, has been in place now for um, probably close to 20 months, which is a real minimal amount of time when you consider um, a transitionary period is con considered to be anywhere from three to five years. You add into those 20 months that 12 of them were um, 
addressing a global pandemic. And that really did need to be our first priority. Um, we were able to do things um, that IHS, by virtue of how they're structured, would have never been able to do. Um, we were able to set up three different um, alternative care sites. We, we started with working with the city at the very beginning um, before the pandemic really hit. Um, that wasn't you know, um, cost effective for the city or the county or even for us because it was under uh, utilized because we hadn't been um, fully impacted by the pandemic. We had an alternative care site that we set up and this was by alternative care, it wasn't just a place to quarantine. We had our staff redirected to provide care directly to our relatives that didn't have a safe place to quarantine and who needed care throughout their COVID. Um, this helped to reduce, I think the, uh, the PRC cost to a level that would have been absolutely exorbitant if we had not set that up. That's something that IHS would have never been able to do, in fact, didn't do. Uh, we invited them to be um, a part, a partner with us in that initiative. And because of the limitations of the federal system, they weren't able to do that. Um, I really appreciate the, um, the financial support that we received from Shine, um, not Shine River, um, uh, OST and Rosebud um, in helping to divert some of their funds so that we could set that up and provide that care um, along with our CDC grant. Um, the pandemic was sort of ebb and flow. So we started out at Travel Lodge and, and then it uh, dissipated and then we got another huge surge and we, we set up another alternative care site working very closely with the camp. Um, and uh, we had a, 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 the third site was at um, Big Sky. Um, there's a, a few things I, I think that need to be clarified, especially for our um, new council representatives. There's a, you know, information that was presented today to say that there's not a governing board. There is a governing board. Um, there is the um, Mini Luzaha Advisory Committee, um, which consists of, um, and there's a governing board. So the advisory committee um, um, started out pre-assumption as um, the um, Unified Health Board. Um, post assumption, that very same group, very same members, um, renamed themselves the Mini Luzaha. We chose on the advisory committee. This advisory committee consists of community members and tribally elected leaders, and they are the people that drive our agenda. Decisions that we made in terms of management, in terms of bylaws, in terms of reporting. Um, that was all driven by um, community and tribal input. Um, we had um, nearly, um, you know, pre-assumption, we had nearly 20 community meetings, some of which were attended by up to 120 people. Um, not all the same members attended every time, not all the members that attended agreed with the direction. Um, and so I just want to remind people that, you know, we have um, about 20,000 users just at OHC. So the, the, the small group that you see here is a reflection of those that have never supported the assumption and have always been, um, uh, you know, had an issue with, uh, as was presented today, um, and as evidenced by the lawsuits that were filed against the health board, the tribes, the IHS, a number of those. Um, so the governing body, um, the, the advisory committee, as I said, was, was um, designed by the, um, the governing body was designed by the advisory committee. And one of the things that evolved that I thought was reflected the infinite wisdom of that group is that 
They recognize that there is a need for community input as well as oversight and engagement by the tribal leaders whose, uh, you know, whose contract that we're, we're holding. Um, but they also recognize the importance of having um, actual governance um, that was comprised of subject matter experts and not tribally elected leaders. So what that did is it separated those powers, right? So our advisory committee is the forward looking um, agenda driving body and the governing body, which consists of um, um, health professionals and um, subject matter experts is, is uh, who looks, uh, at, takes a much closer look at um, quality measures and a number of, of things like that. Um, we have documents that, um, old documents that were shared with you um, today, pieces of old documents that were shared with you today by former contractors and former employees that again are um, not what's in place uh, now and um, is, um, has been skewed or, or misrepresented. In fact, you were presented with a policy that isn't even our policy. So we do have whistleblower policy. We do have a grievance policy. We have policies in place that allow um, employees that have concerns to be able to take their concerns through the chain of command and up to and including um, the executive committee and the uh, board of directors. And the board of directors are the 18 tribal leaders of um, our tribes in the region. Um, you know, the, 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 the reason that the three tribes in the beginning and now the two tribes selected the health board to be the body to implement this um, um, contract is because they are members of the board of directors. So we represent them. They have a seat at that table already. And then the governing body are, were selected again by, by those specific tribes. Um, and again, I think that reflects um, the, the wisdom of, of balancing um, the interests and the protections of the tribes, as well as um, providing um, the um, management oversight. And there's a difference between management and governance. And one of the things that I think that um, our board does very, very well is they um, recognize that um, distinction and that boundary and have really um, explicit processes in place. Um, there was a presentation today that somehow that there, there wasn't those um, processes followed. They were, they were reviewed um, and um, they were um, directed and guided by all the way up to the board of directors. Um, we have 200, probably close to 270 employees, including part-time, temporary interns. Um, I can count probably on one hand, how many people that were um, terminated under my supervision. Um, we, we have a, we, we understand that oftentimes as a tribal organization, we have, um, we are oftentimes dealing with the same kinds of challenges that we're trying to address in our community. So we, we take pride in the fact that we work um, very closely with um, our, um, our staff to coach and groom them um, for growth within the organization. We have um, high expectations around work ethic. That includes, you know, coming to work on time, um, and um, in, includes um, basic ethics, and and we um, we make those those very clear, um, and have a very fair process to um, address those things. Um, so um, there are a couple other things that were mentioned today that um, that uh, I think were really important, and I want to you know reiterate um, some of what our some of our community members were talking about. And one is the construction project. Um, I share the very same concerns that were raised by a number of our uh, community members here. 
I want to provide the context in which um, the health board and at the time, especially when the, all three tribes were on board in the beginning, um, the, the number one concern at that time was there were, well, there were two really important concerns, which I think was the driving force for this, this effort in the first place. And that was um, Sioux San was at a juncture where they were um, about to lose their hospital status. And the only way that that could have been um, um, interrupted is if all three tribes had assumed um, um, pursued 638 contracting. And that was a, a, a big driving force at that time for this. Um, and the other was to um, maintain and save um, the historical buildings on the campus. Um, we had a, a donor, a major developer in the community who um, donated, um, was willing to donate 20 acres for the new facility to be built and the, and the plan um, that again, driven by the Unified Health Board and uh, um, Minnie Luz Alhan, we chose on the advisory committee was that um, we would save those buildings and we wouldn't disturb or disrupt that land. And um, there are a number of things that the community was hoping for, um, a community center. Um, there, was an, there is still a need for a women's shelter. There's still a need for expanded um, residential services. Um, there's a need for, um, medical detox and so you know our our vision was that we would save those structures and that we'd have the opportunity um, to uh, build the new facility off off campus that was um um that was uh, denied by the um, indian health service um there's always opportunity for better communication. Um, now we do have a communications director, a tribal liaison, and I think uh, much of that has um, improved. Um, the tribes do get regular reports. We have monthly meetings with the advisory committee. So, so the information that we gathered for the board of directors and the governing body is shared with the advisory committee. Um, even through the pandemic, we um, still met with the advisory committee um, through through Zoom. Um, the governing body was late to get established. It was um, much of the, um, the the planning and infrastructure for it um, um, was pretty well um, established before the pandemic hit. But all hands were on deck um, for. Um, uh, for the pandemic. So there's, there's a, a number of things that I wish we could have um, addressed and, and, and gotten, uh, been able to work through much quicker um, than we were able to. Um, but especially, you know, the, the um, I shared with you, especially the, the fact that we weren't even able to have access to a D1 line, much less the servers until well into, um, um the assumption months and months nine months following the assumption was the first time we were even able to to establish um a server um so it it uh i just uh, would not allow us access to records so you know we had to build from scratch so people that were coming in that were long-standing um users of susan we had to re-establish um um, records for them and um, in whatever way that the um, institution of IHS could present barriers, they did. And, um, and that was a lot to overcome. But despite that, um, what always came first was um, patient care and every effort to provide patient care. We do have, um, we do, um, consumer satisfaction surveys we have from day one, and those are shared with the advisory committee once a month as well. We have a nearly 90% positive satisfaction rate. And we look very closely, you know, we shared with you some, some, of, some snippets and we didn't just share the good news. We shared those areas that patients told us that we needed to improve. 
Um, there's nothing to be gained by st you know sticking your head in the sand and, and, and denying where there's need for um, improvement. Um, real um, and meaningful improvement comes from um, taking a look at the feedback where there where there needs to be um, improvement. And so we we look at those uh, internally as well as share share them with the um, share them with the um, advisory committee on a, on a regular basis. Um, Uh, there was also, you know, some concerns uh, a couple of people raised about um, when you when you 638 and you diminish um, um, uh, funding. Um, actually, what you know, what the tribes and uh, what the health board was able to do was actually leverage quite a bit extra in contract support costs. And with those contract support costs we were able to ensure that the funding that was in place for uh, the two tribes went 100% towards patient care and the administrative costs are covered under the contract support costs. So there's actually an increase in funding that's available to tribes and tribal organizations at 638, their programs. Also with um, employees that were um, and that came uh, to us as uh, IPAs, and um, we had, uh, I, I believe it was close to 80% of the IPAs that were extended, um, um, accepted. Um, and so um, they did not lose, they, they're they not at risk to lose their um, federal benefits. IPAs are able to maintain their federal status as a federal employee and keep their benefits. Um, what we did see, however, is a number of those IPAs come over as direct hires because our actually our benefits package is, is a lot healthier and more extensive than what is provided by the federal government. Um, we are a tribal organization and we are a 501c3. They're not mutually exclusive tribes all over the country establish nonprofits, they establish uh, for-profits, that is sovereignty in action. And the health board, the reason we have tribal um, um, sovereign uh, immunity is because we are a um, organization, a body of the 18 tribes in the Great Plains, including the three tribes um, who are um, shareholders in, in Sioux San. Um, we have four quarterly meetings with the full board where um, um, a full disclosure of, of our reporting um, um, is provided to the full board on a regular basis. In addition, we provide um, a written, um, written report to the advisory committee and uh, governing body on OHC specific, with, which is then shared with um, uh, the two the two councils. I also want to say um, um, I mentioned earlier that 13% of, of the population that is Rosebud currently are seen at the uh, at OHC and it, it was last winter uh, right before the pandemic hit that the advisory committee, um, requested that I reach out to Rosebud and ask them, um, invite them to have a seat, uh, you know, continue to have a seat on the advisory committee because so many of their members um, are users of OHC. And so, you know, um, there has always been a spirit of wanting to find a way to come together and work collaboratively. And so, um, and, and that stands, um, that stands, um, continues to stand. And um, Skyla has been uh, attending meetings and, and, and represents Rosebud um, at those meetings currently. And um, um, so I think that, you know, the, op the opportunity for um, unification and, um, and just, you know, moving forward in a way that is going to be beneficial to the, to, um, the community and to the tribes is, is absolutely possible. 
we've done a lot in the time that um, we've had. There, yes, there's absolutely room for improvement. But, um, you know, somebody also mentioned the purchase of lacrosse building. Um, one of the very first things that we did in the early months of Assumption is we did a um, massive commun community needs assessment. And the number one topic of concern for our uh, relatives was um, access to behavioral health services. And so from the beginning, we began um, aggressively pursuing uh, grants for behavioral health services. And our intention is to develop a comprehensive system of care. One of the grants is a Circles of Care grant. We have a Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Grant. We're applying for another grant. Um, and the purpose of buying a lacrosse was twofold. One was um, when um, the new building is being built up there, and I don't know if you guys have had a chance to be up there, but it's really difficult for people to, um, to find parking and um, space is being diminished. Um, as part of the construction project, IHS does provide space for their employees, but they did not provide space for workspace for OHC employees. So um, we needed space uh, for that purpose, but also um, for during the construction, but also we're using this space to provide um, currently uh, COVID testing um, vaccination. In fact, I would have been up there um, today. We're having a huge vaccination um, event today. Um, um, so if you haven't had your vaccine, um, uh, get in touch with Ricky if you need a, a vaccine. Um, we're having a big event up there today. But um, and after as COVID services, um, the need for COVID mitigation um, declines, then that will be a comprehensive uh, a site for comprehensive behavioral health services. Um, Let's see, what other notes did I take? Um, I think that's... Geraldine, we have a couple um, council representatives that want to ask questions. Sure. Um, go ahead, Ms. Swift. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Geraldine, um, I'm still kind of upset with you, especially after when we met last last year over at Rosebud at the casino. And um, I guess trying to support this, um, the deal breaker for me was the letter that you submitted stating that if Rosebud didn't get back on board that our members would not be eligible for health care there. And I thought about that quite a bit. And you know, in my mind, it was like, who are you to tell us that? You know, you're supposed to be, you named this facility Oyate, but it's not about the Oyate from what I'm hearing. And, Cause I, I too have attended some of these meetings um, here in Mother Butler. And that's why, how I got to meet some of the um, community members here. Um, you gave some misinformation here, but um, I guess I would like to know when does your when does your contract end? For what? To oversee the Oyate healthcare, or is that just? It's through resolution. Um, so uh, I believe that, so they're renegotiated um, every so often, every two years, I think it is. Um, I think it's up in 2024, I believe, that the next one is. Because that was like in 18, you know, um, that was when I first came on to council. It was the very first time I met you mm -hmm. that day at the council chambers. And then again at our council meeting there out to the casino. Um, so I guess my question is, who all sits on your board? And um, is it the tribal chairman's 
Association, the HHS, Great Plains Tribal Chairman's House Board, who, who oversees and um, who sits on your board and who is the final decision maker? So for the board of directors for the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, it is the 18 tribally elected presidents and chairmen of the tribes in the Great Plains region. So does our tribal chairman yes. attend all your meetings? And do uh, he often um, will send um, Skyla as a proxy, mm -hmm. but he's he's got a seat on the board too. Yes. I have more questions. I think we'll jot them down on different sheets. But um, in regards to the health care here at CSAN, so um, like with our Rosebud members, how are so they they're they're still eligible for health care, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. As I shared earlier, um, actually about thirteen percent of our population are Rosebud members. That go that attend OH. Or yes. Your, mm -hmm because I was told they were not allowed to go there. No, that's not true. No, that's not true. We open the doors to all, um, anyone that is eligible for IHS services. Because anywhere. I think one of the big issues right now is the vaccination and why that's, you know, why why hasn't that been given to, the, to our native population here? Pardon me? Why has not, the, why has the vaccination, why isn't it here yet? It Why is. haven't they had their first doses and their second doses, you know? I'm sorry, I don't know where you're getting your information, but we have well, been vaccinated. Well, how I know my information is when I received my first, um, when I received my first vaccination that same day, mm -hmm. there was, I think they counted 15 from the Rapid City area that was at Rose, but because they didn't have it here. I see. Yes, in the beginning, we had um, a delay in getting vaccinations from IHS, and that's now improved. And so we have been doing um, quite a few vaccination events since then. But you're right, in the very beginning, um, we were receiving just a handful of vaccines. And also, to vaccines. some of the other complaints that we had received that when people came down with COVID, there was no place for them to go to quarantine. And so that's why a lot of them chose to stay at home and do their quarantine there, their we isolation. Had, we had, um, we set up three different alternative care sites. So was you a part of that? And you overseen it and you made sure that everybody that came through those doors received those services? Yes. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, John. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, some of the questions I have, um, Geraldine, are in regards to the IPA assignments that are currently going to expire here soon. Mm -hmm. I apologize, but I didn't hear you address what will happen with those assignments. I, I understand that they will be ending here soon. What will happen with those individuals? They will be um, renewed. So we can only um, uh, enter into IPA agreements every two years. It's consistent with the IHS budget cycle. Um, but our intention is that everyone that currently has an IPA can continue their IPA. Okay. Now, um, you said you have policies for grievances, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Was those policies in place for these so-called disgruntled employees? Yes. They were in place then? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to also know about how many non-members do you currently have on staff out there? Um, we provide a report every month to our um, advisory committee. And I think this last month it was 62% tribal tribally enrolled members. You know, I, I do agree with a, a statement that Michelle made. You know, we do have our own tribal educated mm -hmm. members. And I think every one of them should have an opportunity to work there if they are qualified for those positions. Um, from what I understand, they are. 
you know, I would, um, there's such a thing as employee, um, uh, EP, EPA, whatever it's called, you know, you, you can, you can work with those employees. There, there's a process for that to, to call them in. I know you mentioned something about them coming in late and I think that's petty myself. Um, there's a way to work with it. A lot of our people are single parents, mm -hmm. single mothers. There's situations that come up when these, when they have children who may be sick. You know, there's situations there. Absolutely. And I, I commend every single mother who's out there working mm -hmm. and, the, and the fathers as well, because there are those too. The other thing I wanted to ask about was your um, electronic health system. You said uh, RPM has, RPMS did not work for you. So were you supposed to be responsible for um, installing another system or a new system? How did that work? So um, Indian Health Service was supposed to, um, we, well, in the, in the negotiations, we had offered to I, uh, IHS that we would be responsible for installing those systems. Uh, when assumption um, transpired, they decided that they needed to be the ones to do that. And that really um, created a number of major and significant delays and access problems. Um, if I knew, you know, hindsight being 2020, if I knew then what I know now, I think I would have pursued a totally separate EHR system. Um, EHR systems are extremely expensive, as you probably know, being on health committee. Um, but we are working with um, Monument Health right now. Uh, the, the major EHR system in this region um, is um, EPIC. Yeah, it's utilized by Avera, Sanford, and Monument Health. Um, uh, and um, so we're working with them right now to see if we can um, enter into an agreement under their license. And we'd like to see that um, a, a complete change in the EHR system. Um, it'll be time consuming. It'll be hopefully not too expensive and not as expensive if we had to purchase our own license. Um, I think that'll make um, care coordination much easier because we do have a, a small level of care coordination right now with um, a Monument Health and um, we can see those patients uh, records. And so if we can go to that system, I think in the long run, it'll be much more productive. I just have a couple more and then I will be done, Chairman. Um, the last question, or I have two, I guess. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns I received was um, individuals who call for Susan, those numbers haven't been changed over to Oyate Health. It still comes up as Sue San, so it's confusing for those mm -hmm. community members who are trying to reach either or. Mm -hmm. How long will that process take to get that corrected? So um, we looked into purchasing a whole new phone system when we were um, looking at our startup, um, planning our startup costs. And the cost of a whole new uh, phone system was going to be close to three hundred thousand um, dollars. We knew that the phone system that existed there was very antiquated and um, and not reliable. Um, that was a prohibitive cost, and we looked at the time frame between when we're going to get into the new building and there'll be a whole brand new system phone system at that time. So what we did instead is we did invest about $50,000 in improvements and upgrades, but it's still not ideal. Um, but, uh, and, and you're right, the phone system is, it's, it's, it's what we inherited and it's a, um, um, less than ideal. My last question is, so how do you plan on addressing all these issues with your with so, your PRC. Pardon me, I'm sorry. 
how how do you plan on addressing all these issues with these with the com community members who have all these outstanding bills who are taken who are being taken to small claims court what is your process that you are going to put in place or what is, what are you, what kind of services are you going to provide for these individuals sure so um so the PRC, there's a few things that um, we see that continually come up. One is um, when we negotiated um, the, the contract with IHS, um, um, any bills that were incurred prior to assumption, there was a, a, a significant amount of funds that were left with IHS to pay those PRC bills. So we're responsible for all PRC that's eligible for PRC. So we also know that there's certain eligibility requirements. Um, but for the PRC that we're eligible for and that we provided referrals for, our commitment is to pay those bills. Our PRC team meets daily. Um, what I think um, is a lot of the outstanding issues are um, you know, someone also shared a situation where they where they went to IHS and but their PRC referral was with us. If we don't, we, we've found we've had situations where um, IHS has made a referral, but they didn't let us know. Um, and so then we hear about it later where somebody will come up and say, um, I had this referral and um, it hasn't been paid and we only learn about it um, when they bring it to our attention. That's one of the issues. The other issue being those bills that were incurred prior to assumption. Um, um, so I reached out to um, um, Mr. Driving Hawk uh, just a couple of weeks ago and I asked him to revisit if he would meet with us um, and um, his staff, uh, IHS staff on the second floor to revisit the process because the process that is in place now, which they put in place, we, we, they determined how that would work. We didn't have a voice in that. Um, I asked him if we could sit down and um, come up with a different system. Um, I think there still needs to be a lot more um, community education. Um, I know that um, President Killer was provided a number of, of, of PRC um, uh, issues. Um, a couple of a couple of things that uh, showed there was. Um, some of those bills were not referrals from OHC. Um, a couple of them weren't even um, patients that come to OHC. Um, so there's a lot of um, education that still needs to take place. And um, we are also um, uh, working on a, um, a, a, a quality measure, internal quality measure uh, to measure from the time a PRC referral is made and a follow-up time to see if the appointment was kept. Um, the other thing that happens that comes up frequently is we can make a PRC referral um, for hospitalization. And I don't know if you, you know if you guys have experienced this yourself, but sometimes you can have um, a referral that's approved for a service, but then um, maybe the lab work is provided by somebody else and a bill comes for that separately. Um, so we need to look at how those can be tracked more effectively. Also, um, um, IHS and OHC are the payers of last resort. So sometimes there's delays between when the bill um, comes and when they're paid by Medicaid or paid by a third party biller. We have to wait to see um, what they're going to pay and how much they're going to pay, and then and then we pay the balance. So sometimes there's delays there. Um, we've also, um, you know, had situations where people have brought um, EOBs, explanation of benefits. They think they have a bill or they've gotten a bill, and it's actually an explanation of benefits. Um, 
So we, we just you know, need to work very closely. I think the best way to address PRC is individually and one-on-one -on -one if there's a question or a concern. You know, I heard, also heard um, uh, a couple of people say that they've called me um, um, or, or I haven't called them back. Um, you know, please, um, I hope that you'll give me your number because um, if I don't call you directly, I always have a staff member call directly. Uh, my staff here for me, um, as soon as we get um, a concern or issue that's raised by a community member or a council member, um, it's, in, you know, we, we really do our best to um, respond. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done with PRC. And then the other um, person that, persons that need to come to the table are our vendors. Um, what was really surprising to me is how very little our vendors know about PRC as well. And so um, we try to remind them that legally that they are not to send bills to our members if they receive a referral from us. Those bills are to come directly to us, but we know that there's a lot of our members that still get bills. And so we um, respectfully remind them that that's um, not legal for them to do. But those are just a few of the um, approaches. Okay, um, we have Ms. Wan. I too am still upset about the meeting, the way it started, the way it ended. And then you came to our council chambers a couple times. We were all voted in by the Oyate. So that's who you need to listen to. Any one of us can get up and give a good story without documentation. How many of us have seen their financial reports on their travel, their salaries? How many employees do you have right now, Mr. 270 with part-time temporary interns. And how many are non-Indian? Um, we have 62, I think it's 62% that are um, tribally enrolled members and of our staff. What is your degree in? Is it in health? I have a master's degree from the University of Michigan in nonprofit management and social work. Is, it in, is your degree in health? I have a background in health. Okay. Um, it was really disturbing to hear you talk off and on today because when you got up earlier, you said, and you kind of looked over your shoulder, you said, this is a small group referring to our people out there. I don't recall saying that, but okay. You know, that small group is more than one, it's more than five and it's more than 10. So that's a red flag for any of us. They have a voice, they're not being heard, their services aren't being provided. And I'm thankful that this meeting took place again today because things need to change drastically before we lose another life because we are causing an emotional state here to our people, mentally, physically, and the ball has been in your court and I haven't seen no solution to it. And you just said that your contract, Ms. Swift just asked you when your contract's up, you said 2024. I don't think this, thing, this can go on till 2024. And yes, it is a change and it is something new, but when it comes to our people's lives, we can't continue to allow things like this to happen. And the construction that's going on right now, tearing down our buildings at Susan, that should have never even started. That's right, I agree with that. And Mr. Driving Hawk, maybe he needs to come here and maybe we should have a meeting like this and he should be right here in the center of this room mm -hmm. answering for us. I heard some of the people today say, you know what, let's give up our lease money if it's gonna take that. I had one even, we heard one say, we feel like orphans. No one should feel like that. Our people mm -hmm. shouldn't feel like that. And it's lack of leadership 
communication. And none of us should should be given a story. Um, and you said a phone line are the the phone system could cost up to three hundred thousand. How much travel have you guys taken? Has it been over three hundred thousand? Maybe that would have taken care of our phone line. There's a lot that weighs in at, at this table. But at the end of this day and tomorrow, it's the people that are in this community that matter the most. Mm -hmm. I agree. And you, you say you agree, but I don't know about anybody else, but I've been watching her job this whole time. She hasn't really been taking notes. She's been on her phone. And at times take notes when Shirley phone, was talking a few times at the, this morning, you kind of had a little smirk on your face or it was like going in one ear and out the other. And these are our people that we're talking about here. And um, I, I feel this is my opinion and I'm gonna say it because I won't be here tomorrow but the construction needs to end, not tomorrow, it needs to end today. We need to reserve what buildings we have up there because that's history. We have a lot of, a lot of our people have experienced things up there and we need a change right there. And it needs to begin today or tomorrow so that our, our people up here have a, a good health education and you know what? The healing needs to start today or tomorrow. It doesn't need to start when her contract's up in 2024. That's going to be a lot of damage done before that, that even gets here. And I really want to thank you guys for having this meeting. And I feel that we need to have this more often, not just on health, but on education, the youth, the elders, um, our land, everything, you guys because we have a new president now. Look what he has changed for the native, for us. He's on our side. So, hey, instead of the Ogallalas going to DC first, let's go hand in hand. <laughs> let's go hand in hand. Let's go together. Let's go strong and tell them that, that we're a voice and we do matter. So I'm really thankful to be here today with everybody at this table. We need to have these meetings more, you guys, we do. We're powerful people, we're strong, and we need to start listening to the people. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, and, and you know, I think I, I, we will we'll all agree, you know, about going together, but we got dibs on making them the relative first. So. <laughs> uh, Garfield and then Miss Whitepipe, you're after Mr. Stiff. Good morning, um, relatives and all the elected leaders. Um, you know, from from when I'm 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 listening, and you know, I, I share the frustration that our people have that are coming forward. And you know, I, I was going to mention that that um, you know there is a fourth component that's missing at this meeting, and that is Mr. Driving Hawk and, and IHS. You know, from the Ogallala Sioux Tribe standpoint, you know, we have, you know, we have issues with IHS at home. And I, I heard this lady say earlier that um, the healthcare system been failing us for the last three years, but, you know, healthcare system been failing our people for decades. And it's, and it, it, IHS is the bigger problem, you know, we talk about how our people are being misdiagnosed, given wrong medications. You know, they cause some death with our people. And IHS is responsible for all of that. You know, people talk about treaties and the treaty, it don't specify who runs the dollars. It just says that they will provide the healthcare. And I really wished you know, our people back home would support getting away from IHS. It seems like we're, we're dependent on IHS a lot that it's like they're our only option when really they're not. Our people deserve, deserve better healthcare. 
than what they're receiving, not just our members up here, but back home too. You know, you, you, you look at contract house, life or limb policy, a lot of our people are going around with, with uh, issues with their, their health, their body, because they can't get referrals out. There's a lot of issues with healthcare that needs to be addressed from everybody. And I, I, I really hate the, I really hate it when there's an organization where they they feel like they're untouchable, like IHS. They have those unions with their employees where you can't address them because they're so protected. You know, I really hope that's not the situation here with the Oyate House Center. If our people have concerns, you know, they should be addressed. There shouldn't be a brick wall up. We should be able to, to address those issues for our people instead of turning our back and acting like IHS. You know, if, if we were losing IHS last administration, you know, I support you know, Ryan and Jackie and whoever else, you know, made that decision last administration to 638. I support that. That's just me personally. But, you know, in, in 2012, when I was on the tribal council under President Brewer's administration, I think Jackie and I don't know if Alajan was on there, but, you know, we had a meeting up here with all the Ocheti Shakoni tribes to address all the issues. And, and we had all the tribes come forward and we, we talked about health and education and it seems like it never changes, you know? It's like we, we talk, talk in circles and, and no one cares to listen to us. So, uh, you know, it is my recommendation, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Killer and Chairman Jumpnigo that we do have another meeting like this, but we do have driving hawk here. He really needs to hear us because this is a bigger issue than an administration running our IHS, or our dollars, or whatever. But I do support the Ogallal Sioux Tribe as a council representative. I do support their 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 action last administration to, to get away from IHS. I'm not a big fan of IHS, and I know some of you are employees of IHS. I apologize, but you know, it's not the best health care for our people. And I'll stay on that stance, and I'll, I'll stand by my words. But I do know one thing that our people do deserve better health care. We have people that are dying because of the way we're treated, because of you know the misdiagnostic di diagnostics by the, the doctors or whatever. And and before I close here, you know, off off subject, but, and I'm glad Rosebud's here, the leadership in the Cheyenne River. But when you have the opportunity, go up to the Mini Luzaha camp. Yeah, relatives there. Us guys been feeding them every Saturday. S several of us council reps, we feed them on Saturdays up there. You know, go check on your people up there because they're having a hard time. And, and I'm really thankful that we have people that are taking care of our relatives here on the streets. It's a good place. We, we recently purchased a nice tent for them where, where they, they could keep warm, but it's really nice up there. So. Just wanted to close on that, but I do thank you guys for coming, responding to the this call, and you know if if things need to be changed, then let's change it for the betterment of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Still, Miss White Pipe. Good afternoon. I think uh, a lot of the issues that I wanted to address were were uh, discussed with my colleagues prior to me standing up to speak here, but um. There were a couple of concerns that I wanted to address with you. And, and when I did make the motion to rescind our resolution and joining, we had a lot of concerns at that time. And I'm really disheartened to hear that they still exist and, and even have gotten worse. Um, there are two things I just wanted to run by you. If you can give us some insight on what your efforts were on community education prior to assuming the Susan Hospital. Um, and then the other one is uh, concerning our Rosebud tribal members, why is it that they're using OHC? Is there a reason why? Because because of they're not they don't want to use IHS? Is it because of residency? And if you serve everybody, why are why are patients sent to go somewhere else to take an x-ray? And why is the process 
you know, why is somebody having to go to three different areas in order to, to be served? So I would like to uh, maybe have our new council members informed on what efforts were made to for the community education part. And then, and then a, the detailed operation and expense of your financials, is that given to all tribal or all tribes or is that is to, it just like a yeah. balance sheet or something? Yeah, I think that would be something that we would like to see also. If we can get that. Sure. Okay. Um, so prior to assumption, um, um, we held almost 20 community meetings over a period of um, probably over a year. Um, we had th those meetings were attended um, by as some meetings as, as, as little as 15 people um, to some meetings being attended by over 120 people. Um, we, um, the, the initiative to even assume on behalf of the tribes came from the tribes themselves in response to a number of the concerns that were raised by the community regarding their health care um, at Susan. In fact, the impetus for that was um, um, in 2015, you, many of you may remember that IHS was receiving quite a few um, CMS findings in their, in their reviews. And, and one of those locations was Susan. IHS invested resources to try to address those discrepancies um, at other locations like Pine Ridge and Rosebud and um, uh, Winnebago. But for Susan, their answer, their idea of a solution and answer was to close the hospital. And so that was sort of the impetus for the tribes to begin looking at um, 638 and, and came to um, both Dr. Warren and I to do a, a analysis and a, the feasibility of pursuing a 638 contract. So we did engage um, quite extensively with the community, but as I said, um, there is um, a faction of the community that never um, really supported the idea and, um, and many of those same folks are are the ones that are here um, today. Um, we, um, both Indian Health Service and Oyate have always said from day one that it didn't matter where anyone was enrolled, that we will see whoever comes to our doors. Um, and um, so I, I, I can't speak for the Rosebud members, but I do know that 13% of the 18% that live in Rapid City come to um, Oyate Health Center. Um, our uh, patient registration has increased from about 15,000 to nearly 20,000 now over just the last 20 months. Now, some of that is because of COVID, but I think a lot of that has to do with um, the quality of care. Um, we do patient satisfaction surveys within every department. Um, at OHC and our positive um, positivity rate is at about 90% um, positivity rate for their experience. So again, I think that's, I share that data because it's, it's really easy to get sort of hooked into um, an emotional response of, of a few where things may not be working um, for them, but that's not the whole picture. And I think that's really important to, um, to be aware of and recognize. Um, we, um, are, we have asked Indian Health Service a number of times to please refer um, their folks that go to IHS on the second floor to OHC for their lab and radiology. Um, we get people who have, who prefer to come on campus and stay on campus for those services, but um, Indian Health Service um, um, management has decided that um, 
that they they choose to refer those services um, out um, to um, to outside vendors. So oftentimes those that do go to IHS have to go to other locations to a non tribally run program for those services. Um, I've asked, we, in fact, in our most recent consultation with them, we brought that up again and asked them to um, share with us in writing why it is they feel that they have to send um, folks out to um, a third party for services that they could be receiving at OHC. Um, finances are shared um, in full. On, we do our uh, financial uh, reporting on a, a quarterly basis to the full board. And then we also um, share our third party um, activities and um, OHC specific activities with, um, with uh, the two tribes through the advisory committee and governing body. Um, so um, I think, did that cover all your questions, Lisa? I don't know if there was other, did I miss one? Um, yeah, not in full detail, but um, I know we haven't been involved since we pulled out with our or the sending of our resolution, but we're here sitting at the table today in hopes that we can help you as a community to resolve your issues up there, work with IHS and see what how Rosewood can help you with the other two tribes and to seeing how we can um, make it more efficient and better healthcare for all of you. We appreciate that very much. And I will continue, you can smirk at me all you want, but we will continue to progress and look after our people this is not an issue of her against me. This is an issue of this community and 60 people within a month's time called and complained, which we put in your packets to say the problems that they experienced. In that little amount of time, when you see those types of dissatisfaction of services, that is a red flag and we need to get on it. So, you know, I'm not going to pit for pat with this Mrs. Church. We have extended ourselves to her on several occasions, five as a matter of fact. And she does not want to, she doesn't want to conform to us. We ask for a community election. That's all we ask for. Let this community say who they want to represent them. But no, she chooses to get resumes and select whoever she wants to be on that board. And yes, she has you tribal people elected by the people on her board. But in this community, no. And until that's done, I will not promote her. I will not support her, nor will I endorse her. And I feel that's the, the feeling of this community. And that's why I say it. So with that, I just want to say, you know, we all know, and I know, for 21 years working in Washington, D.C., and Russell, you know that. You came to my home. I opened my doors to you. I opened the doors to everyone, to my Uncle Oliver and the elders that came. My doors were always open to our people, no matter which tribe they were. And I must say that in this whole process, I just has not been our best buddy. But what are we doing to correct it? Nothing. For 40 years, we've allowed them to give us chicken feed and have us on a priority system and let us divide and conquer and fight here. It's not fair to our people and it's not fair to us. So we've got to stand up We've got to talk. If I can help in any way with any tribe writing things or helping, I'm here. I don't know how much longer I'll be here because I'm 72 now, although I think I'm like 50. But, um, you know, I, I'm here and, and I know the system. I know the system. I know the things that have, that have gone on. 
and I intend to keep fighting for people in this community. And I was looking at Madonna. Madonna Long worked for me at Winnebago. Madonna Long saved me big time. I was put on a pr performance improvement plan that had to be done in 90 days by IHS because they did not have the medical records up to date. They didn't have a business office in place. And so they put me on fine, but we did it. And I, and I think I've never thanked Madonna for that. And I know that within the IHS system, there are you know, nooks and crannies that need to be improved, but it's not a crutch. It's not a crutch, Geraldine. You had the opportunity for two years now to do things and it hasn't happened and it has jeopardized and put our people at a diminished service and a, and a disparity. And we could be sitting here writing up interagency agreements and memorandum of agreements to make sure that we can enhance our program, not sit here and point fingers. And that's what I would expect of you and I would expect our leaders to expect good of you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Portsunder. We have Mr. In the Woods. Hello, Mr. Kipke. When I learned bit to get the coaching and clean up, when I cooked up now, La Cote up in Hop, La Cote with Chokana, La Yani, Uyaka, Pikile, Hop, La Naku, Scarwich, Ashi, Hop, Hop, La Monspe, Kiki, Hele, Mugusba. He was dead, and he was dead. He Minahaska at the Wopre, Ota, Dahe. Now, let the cutter get you have you have this me head here. Now, Minahaska, who opened you have to get washed there. When I must have got out a hickte. Now, open and call and hop to Hedger. La cutter get la cutter yantiki took a hedge say and got me up to Hedger. Le Titron Oyatiki Nankapiki Le Le Daku Ota and Hop Woshak and Hop Makocha and Hop Now let Dwayne Ihani Ahi Now Chanupa Wakan Let you say As Tokai Tumia Nupa Let you say one 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 zero Le Daku Wakan we are still at her. Nataku let the song we are hiki le oyateki toka yuastek the echa. It's hot chana. Mana ho ho chana we are. Ask the honey, it's hot chana, not a hecha, hechis no hop. A chanupa he, unkisi up there. Hey we are only extus yam snio. Hey we are not scowy, scowy char yap no hop kile. It was crazy. As a care was there. As La Cota Yap no happy kile, Wakan, Hecha. He kicks you up. Let Daku, Nakota, and happy kile, Wakan. He twin gaga kile, a heap. Now I learned better key with tools on it. No kiss care. We ain't not got that care. Up 
Aș vrea pete că dacă le o api, na o frechi le, da, eu știam cu a. Eu că știu le scaui ce așa care, na o n-am hap. Aș suci de, de la main language, de la, if you look in the Webster dictionary, you can say one word and it means a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe two means what we mean, but they could use those other stuff on us. Just like the elder gentleman said, you use a judge to decide. And I, I was mentored by Leroy Curley, who considered himself a Dumia, a scout for our people. We're in the same band, two kettle. And I worked for a lot of elders, or World War II, all fluent old bloods. It kind of taught me how to act and think. And uh, we had this, I didn't get to get one to Rodney, but I gave one to uh, President Killer. We had a, back in 20, February, back in 2016, when the Committee on Indian Affairs was going around, and that was at uh, Pine Ridge and Rosebud and Winnebago, I think. Uh, uh, a good friend of mine called uh, Fred Sidna. He said there was something happening down here in Toons here, and that was MMS, and they were doing that, uh, they were getting testimony. So I took that to the, he told me what's going on, so I took it to the health committee. I was a CHR at that time. And this is my fourth term as a as an IRA counselor. And, and Ryman's the chair and I'm the vice chair of the health committee. I take this seriously because uh, um, I see our people and I hear the complaints, the same complaints at home. And we had our own tribal member running the CEO and you know, our tribal health and even our, our medicine wheel village, you know, we took all the precautions and everything like that. And we lost 35, and that's including uh, some Pashichilas. So that's what I always learned from the elders. This is a life and death situation. And that's how you gotta take it, take it you know, because uh, Leroy was at uh, Wounded Knee too. He was a Marine too. And um, I'll tell you something right now where the best healthcare in the world, how are we gonna do that? So right now I gave another paper that we sent October 9th. We got CDC dropped it up the vaccination playbook, they call it. And now we're seeing all this money coming on CARES and now the American recovery plan. So on one side, you know, if we have a negativity and positivity, and that's what I meant about the two scouts. And the Washitula uses the DSM-5 now. And this mental health thing that, you know, some of our people are going through, and, uh, like some of our combat veterans, uh, some of that stuff they're dealing with, you know, we really have to look at the best healthcare, especially our elders and the what kinds of going on. They're saying this COVID, it, it might be dormant in these children. And we have our, the most, the 20 to 40 year olds, that's where the most are at Shine River. And we have them from an uh, eight month baby. And uh, we've got a couple of hundred year old generians, you know, and that's really good because they ate good. And, uh, my mom loved to 100. She passed away, but they, they ate good. My dad was up in the 90s. He was the last of his kind. So to me, we're in a situation where we need to put together who we are, and we need to fight with these tribal governments to get what is deserved to us. And I'll use the veterans coming back from Desert Storm and Iraqi freedom. If it wasn't for the mothers 
storming them hallways and kicking those uh, reps and those senators where, where it hurts. They coughed out 10 billion, you know, 5 billion to get those veterans, the young guys that were killing themselves, the help they needed. That should have been a sign when those Green Berets came back and they, they killed themselves. That should have told uh, these politicians, I call them politicians because they're bullshitters, you know. But we're men and women and we're distinct because of who we are. And we stand up with the Washita Latina. This is how we have to go at it. Because God made us with two hands, not with just English. This is where our power is at. And I believe because I do what Leroy left when he passed on into the real world. I picked up his job as a scout. I scouted in DC and I scouted at the United Nations. Even the South Dakota House, where we got an inside man over there. You call him Double Lap Seven. But, you know, I, I think addressing some of the elders' concerns there. And, and when we had Julia Bondi come, she's a Democratic uh, California subcommittee in, in uh, Veterans House. And she brought a VA a doctor, female doctor, house up over here. And uh, we put some star blankets on them. And they both cried, you know, at their vet center because they never, they don't know us. She's an ally. Her chief of staff makes things happen. Like Vision 23, you know, that's us guys. They're not doing enough here for us. Now the veteran, we got that copy now. And now in IHS, which a lot of veterans don't want to go to IHS, they're going to tribal health. I am too. Does that tell you something? I was a COVID 76 day long hauler and I kept asking the IHS provider, you know what a long hauler is? Have you read the report from the UK of what Vietnam is doing or Israel is doing? It's a global pandemic. And what I learned from this year, March to March, listening under these consultations and hearing, hearing our people and hearing IHS is a, I call them federal talking heads, corporate federal talking heads. And I use that word now, yes, massa, yes, massa. That's how frustrated I am. Yeah. And um, we're planning a march. And it's in a good way, because in that, that fifth one, cultural sensitivity training, that's what these providers need from IHS. We had our own tribal member that's not there no more. We got a Captain John Schuhart come in, and first 9 a.m. briefing every morning since March, every morning at 9. Now we have a, a CEO that's has an open door, come see me, call me. Because that door was closed all this time. We asked for information, show me your policy if we can't get our own records, you know, that we were. And we were told by our own members there, you have to get a FOA. Yes, master? Yes, man. Stress, if these elders are going through, that causes them to get sick, cause you to get sick. And you shouldn't be going into that healthcare wherever it's at and be stressed. That's what's happening. It's got to end. We can make it end together because it's happening in every reservation here from Hopi to Seneca. Every reservation is happening. Now, some of these bigger tribes that have some money that really invested in their healthcare. There might be, because I heard that. I, I, I kind of come in when I, we had our vice chairman, uh, Bob Chase and I, we got our vice chairman, Bob Walters. I started coming to these meetings. First thing I asked is their community involvement. And there was about three, one tribal member from home. Yeah, we've been meeting as a community. And I was watching this progress and it's a good one. 
there was a good progress. And uh, like a white man has theory when I was an alcohol counselor for a healing center, this white guy is sitting in the subways and he's watching these guys talking to themselves. They were talking negative to themselves. So he said, well, if they talk positive, so he came up with that theory. You're, you're alcoholic and you know, you got all this negativity talk, start talking positive. And then positive things will happen. Just like those scouts, that scout that turned into a messenger from creators we on that came to us. And that scout that left the world because of his bad thinking, bad talking. Remember our stories, because that'll make us strong. You know, there's a lot of assimilation going on in, in higher ed government. A lot of colonized thinking at all levels, IHS, tribal health, tribal council. But if we hang on to who we are, we chose on it. We have a way. I just won't recognize it for us. Our Pajuta, which when I was a long hauler, I was taking our Pajuta. And I got some chronic conditions, body service related. But those two medicines for me, that IHS give me cheap medicines. So now they refer me to a specialist. If you're B, if you're a veteran, all the veterans in here, they're gonna, they're gonna, their BA is gonna pay for it. So we want some victories. But are we getting the best health care? <laughs> That doctor, that immunologist I seen, she said, I'm not going to give you a second opinion. That's what I'm going to stick with. And I want to taper down. She hand read it to my other doctor that I seen the other day. And he tapped me on the back, call me, come see me. Fetch it to a low. That's health care. The other doctor, he said, he looked at the medicines. He said, these are two medicines. And this medicine she put down 1600 bucks a shot. There's a lawsuit that just came out, Robert Kennedy. Those Kennedys are good. And that lawsuit is against the US government. Kennedy and Big Tree won, so there's no mandatory vaccines. Big Pharma, CDC, FDA, NIH, HHS and IHS, the big pharma for 32 years, no quality control over the vaccines. Kennedy did that for the Wakanja. The kids that he sent to school and they, they jabbed them with no quality control. They can't do that no more. You can cite this law here. And now if you, been keeping track of this vaccination playbook. They rammed that down our throat. They sent us a letter September 24th, 25th. Uh, uh, Secretary Azar said you got to, us guys had till the 29th to respond. October 9th was the deadline. So we did the best we could and we sent off our comments to protect all the say, all rights reserved without prejudice. Because you represent the Lakota people, you're protecting them. So the strategy that we need, you know, I, wanted, I was going to give some history about like uh, Indian, that Indian care health, Indian health care improvement when it came. But now Obama made that mandated funding on Affordable Care Act in. because it was just discretionary. Now Obama in 2010 he put up. 6.6 .6 billion, it raised it 3%, so it went to 51%. So IHS is funded 49% from 100%. That's the fight, you guys, that's the fight. And that other gentleman said it right. If we have our ducks in order, the veterans are winning, not. Finally, IHS refers 
VA is going to cover us. Third party for for tribal health and IHS monies. Third party, build that up to us veterans. But what about the other ones? So we have to protect everybody in treaty territory. I, I had this 46 items when I went to facilitate these meetings back in 2016. We were supposed to have a big healthcare meeting with IHS meeting, public health meeting, but the council changed it to hearing. So he's right on. When you have a hearing, then you have a court reporter and you get everything documented by court law. I had six people. Five said, I, they don't want retaliation. These, these are malpractice suits. One said, I'll do it. Malpractice suits. I told Congressman Brownlee when we started at IHS with the former CEO and they brought a guy down from Aberdeen. There was an elder, came into the emergency room, sent home, didn't want to go back the third time. They finally sent her out, she died. My, both my, my relative, male, same thing, three times. Third time, they finally sent him out, he's gone. A baby, specialist in Sioux Falls. They should have flew her out from ER right there. They waited three hours, that baby died. You know, so that's what I mean. I'm pretty, pretty, pretty upset with it, but you know, you don't get upset mad, you get even legally. So let's do it, let's start strategizing. I'd like to see you guys a strategy too, and let's share that powerful stuff for our people. You know, let's let this negativity go. Because we're all in the same boat, fighting the same battle. I was mistreated as a COVID patient. Three times. So that meant I went with 14 days without treatment. I suffered. You know. So I understand them about IHS when they went to prevention, detection, and treatment. I've been pounding that treatment drum for a year. So I go back to federal talking heads and yes, master. Come on up a little. Thank you, Mr. Hindewood. Um you know, I like what you said about getting even, you know, whenever, uh, I just want to um, speak real quick. When we went to, we had that meeting in Rosebud, Mr. Bordeaux, Mr. Eagle Bear, um, you know, we were in, we were in Suchongu country and he, you guys had a lot of Oglala jokes. So when I seen Mr. Eagle Bear walk in today, I was like, all right, it's my chance to get even. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, Mike, so I, I got a list here, Mr. Carlo, Mr. Yellowboy, then Mr. Eagle Bear. Today, members of our tribes came forward and I firmly believe that they did not come up here to tell stories. They brought facts and it took courage, pride, humility, and where did they get that? They got that from our ancestors in the sacred Paha Sapa where we're at today. And now we have to take that and move it forward. How we're gonna address this. You know, my mother and my adopted sister's mother and Mr. Steele's grandmother, you know, they fought for healthcare for over 20 some years in Pine Ridge how we got a new hospital. The conception of getting a new hospital was that the healthcare was gonna be the best ever for our people. But yet today it's ironic. Here we are now fighting the battle that they started. And I believe the saying about, if you wanna wrestle with a pig, you're gonna get muddy. And that's what we need to do. And we all say we want changes in just 
You know, we had to take some strong stands on our council. We had a member, non-member of our tribe that worked at IHS and we removed her and we tried to get attention from Mr. Driving Hub, but he never would. But the time, the, immediately when we had that lady removed, he was calling, wanting to sit down at our table, but we don't have a chair for him at our table, but we have a chair for him at all of our table where we can get some answers to the questions that our people are asking and that our membership on our councils are asking. But we have to be united in this fight. We want to overhaul IHS, but I think we need to overhaul Great Plains too. The need is here for our people. And I'll be damned if I'm going to step back two steps and not let this happen for our people. My mother fought for over 20 some years for health care. And I think now and my sister, we will take that fight and we will fight to the end. But together we talk about how we're going to do this. You know, I firmly believe in our chairman and our chairman of our HHS committee. Ryan's a great leader on this committee and under his leadership, we're going to come back to another meeting and we're going to have questions that we still haven't had answers to. We're going to have a list of things that we're going to do in his committee that we're going to bring forward. And I think each one of our Council should do the same. We need to have answers. And one of the questions that no one even asked is, you know, we had tribal charters and organizations that got our tribe into a lot of trouble financially with the IRS. Is it my understanding that there's a problem now with IRS, with Great Plains? No, there isn't. Um, the one of the reasons that the tribes um, uh, utilized the health board as a vehicle for 638 is because we have um, a, a long-standing positive um, audits. Um, and then also one of the other misperceptions that was presented today is that the tribes are um, somehow legally or financially um, at risk, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, actually, the health board took a risk when we um, agreed to assume the uh, management of SUSAN on behalf of the tribes. Um, that responsibility is solely on, on the health board. So um, obviously for that reason, we are fully committed to making sure that this is successful and, and that we do that um, with the support of the tribes um, that we're working for. Well, I don't know if that means we put those members at risk either. And I don't think that should come into play either. But, you know, I think that's gonna be one of the questions that's gonna come out of our tribe that we you know we want questions answered on that. But today, you know, I feel like given the loudest war hoop ever, because I'm proud that we're here today. And I think moving forward, you know, we talked about getting together on many other issues, the three tribes. And I think we have to knock on the door to Aberdeen, you know, land issues. They're very serious land issues, even with what's going on here today and our camp up there. You know, we're talking about trying to make sure that their permit or whatever has to be done. And it's crazy that you have to have a permit on your own land. You know, I don't understand that. You know, we met with the National Park Service in Believe it or not, some of the answers to our questions would 
are flabbergasting. A lot of the money generated for timber sales, do any of you know where that money goes? A lot of that money goes to the schools in the Northern Hills. Now, why aren't our schools getting 100% of that money? We need to be fighting a bigger fight, people, but it starts here today. Thank you, Mike. Um, Mr. Yellowboy. You know, uh, today was a, a, a time that I look forward to to come and hear these concerns. Last time we were here, Mr. Fer, uh, Mr. Ekofiu stopped me and I said, you know, I'm here to listen. Just to listen, to hear these concerns, and then to come back with some questions, to hear both sides. I grew up knowing their mother. Their mother was very influential on, on bringing that hospital to Pine Ridge. I was that big. I was about eight years old. My grandma Teresa went around with their mom Arda. We got a hospital there because of them. They were on a health board. Here I am today sitting in this circle, pushing for better health care. And I agree with Ms. Juan over there. I 100% agree that these meetings need to happen. Our health care is not something to take into light. We have people die back in our reservation. IHS isn't the key. IHS is not the key. We had, we had an individual sent home because he had heartburn. They diagnosed him with heartburn. Three, times, three trips later, he died because he had a massive heart attack. IHS is not the key. We sit here and, and I'm glad that we're all sitting here at the table. You know, I'm, I'm young, I'm learning. A lot of you have, are seasoned. You know, this is my first term sitting as a council representative from my district. So I'm learning, I ask questions, I watch. The other night I was on YouTube and I got on Rosebud's council and I, and I applaud Mr. E e Bear Eagle over there by standing up and saying, let's hold the federal government accountable. Little does he know I follow him and, and listen and watch how he speaks on their council. And I agree, we're missing a prong here. We're missing Mr. Driving Hawk. He is not in the best interest of our people when it comes to health care. He needs to be brought here. And I'll make that motion through our, our HHS committee, Mr. Chair, to offer that in, or not offer, but demand that Mr. Driving Hawk appear in a joint session with all the tribes sitting here, not just within our tribe because he needs to be held accountable. He needs to answer for some questions. So I'll make that motion. Okay, so I have a motion. Um, Don, did you get the motion? Motion by Mr. Yellowboy, second by Ms. Carlo, Ms. Spotted Bear, Mr. Knoyer, Mr. Youngman. No, name everybody. But... So roll call vote, Don. Ella John Carlo? Yes. Garco Skill? Yes. Joe Canoyo Jr. <laughs> James Krauss? Julian Spotted Bear? Yes. Brian um, Tyler Yellowboy? Yes. Wendell Youngman Jr. Yes. Jackie Sears? 
Oh, huh. And Richard Ironclaw. Yes. Eight four. A motion carried. Um, Mr. Yellowboy, I guess we should have put a a date on there. Or when was he thinking? But we can we can uh, we can go ahead. All of our um, IHSs are going to be receiving a great amount of COVID money coming in. And we want to be a part of that plan of what they're going to do with that money. So if we can um, put that time frame as soon as possible, so we're a part of that whole planning process, because that, that money is going to belong to the people, not, not IHS. So when you say as soon as possible, um, I guess, Mr. Bordeaux, um, um, Ryman, can you guys, if we can get Mr. Driving Hawk to commit, can we go next week sometime? Will you guys be, be up to that? I mean, next Thursday, next Friday. John said, she have bingo, she said. Whatever works for you guys. I mean, I guess we need to reach out to Mr. Driving Hawk and demand that he's here. But I mean, I guess we'll get with, with our president and, and Mr. Bordeaux and, and Mr. Frazier or whoever the representative from Eagle Butte and we can get that set up. Go ahead, Mr. Bordeaux. Yeah, we have three council meetings, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. So probably Friday would, yeah. Yeah, Friday would. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Also along those lines with Mr. Dr in regards to Mr. Driving Hawk, um, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe has requested him on several occasions to be in attendance to our council meetings and he never responded. So how do you, how do we get him to come here? Because at that time there was a motion made for him and Mr. Wiaki to be in attendance. So the Oglalas are leading this fight. He'll be there. <laughs> Mr. Chair, can I ask you also to extend that even higher to, to uh, Elizabeth Fowler. She is the new Indian Health Service exec, um, director. And that would be great because then at that time, you could hold them all accountable. You know, one of the things that Santi told me is he said, uh, and Roger and I go back a long time. Um, he said, surely it doesn't make any difference what the tribes do. And if we want, we didn't, we want, we didn't want driving Hawk, but we didn't have a choice. He said that he was constantly put on the slate, put on the slate, everybody else they wanted was taken off the slate. So he said, we got driving Hawk with no choice of the chairman. And I don't think we should let IHS go on that. I think you should also ask Elizabeth Fowler to be here. Okay, thank you. Ms. Swift, um, uh, uh, well, I think, uh, um, I was gonna make that motion, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, yeah, Tyler. Well, I, I just kind of wanted to make a quick comment as well, but I will second the motion. Um, there were some of you, I know Bryce, Ryman, um, some of some of us, maybe they're, maybe they're on the councils, but they're not here. But there was a meeting maybe three, four years ago that took place at the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. And um, Mr. Driving Hawk was there. And there was a vote of no confidence taken by all the chairmen that were present. And um, he was there, he knew it, you know, it passed. But yet, we get him, you know, again, that's just the way it goes with them. You know, they don't listen to us. Go ahead, Go ahead Mr. Yellowboy. So, uh, 
I'd like to make a motion to have the uh, tribal leaders from the three tribes here, Chairman Frazier, Chairman Bordeaux, and Chairman Killer draft a unified letter and send it to Aberdeen demanding their appearance before us. So that'll be my first motion. Okay, motion by Tyler, second by Alajon. Oh, Garf, comment. Well, I also think we should include Mr. Joe Emia, and if we could, some the delegation from our uh, our offices, from our, um, the senators and uh, the representative. I mean, we because if Driving Hawks is going to blow us off like he did in the past or whomever, you know, we need to make sure our congressional delegation, you know, if we can, you know, get someone from their office. I know they have our office here in Rapid City. If we could get a letter to them also. Mr. Yellowboy, can you include that in your motion? I will, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, go ahead, Julianne. Julianne and then... Uh... Council, Councilman Yellowboy, would you um, include Mr. LaPointe in that group as well? And Elizabeth Fowler also to be included in your motion? For her to be in attendance here also. So, so Mr. Amy, Miss Fowler, is that her name? Elizabeth Fowler. Elizabeth Fowler. And Mr. Lapointe as well. Don't forget Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, I think, Don't forget uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the um, congressional. The congr uh, oh yes, as as a congressional delegation office. Yeah. I think Mr. Eagle Bear had a comment before he run the vote. Okay, go ahead, Ryman. Yeah, just uh, as Bryce said, could the CEOs of the IHSs, the three tribes? Okay, can you include that, Mr. Yellowboy? Yeah. Yes, okay. Don, you have all the, we'll get with you, Don, for all the, the names and the people, but um, motion by Tyler, a second by Alajon, roll call vote. Oh, go ahead, Jackie. Sorry. I got one more name. Uh, Dan Davis. Could we get him on there too? Yes. Okay. Add Dan Davis. Run the vote. Ella John Carlo? Yes. Garfield Still? Yep. Joe Kanoya Jr. Yes. Julian Spotted Bear? Yes. Arlo Yellowboy? Yes. Wendell Youngman Jr. Yes. Jackie Sears. Oh. Uh -huh. Richard Ironcroft. Yes. Eight four. Okay. Motion carried. Um, on the list, I have Mr. Eagle Bear and Mr. Frederick, and then uh, we'll, we'll we'll start wrapping it up. I know we were, we have this room till five, and they said if we go after five, they're gonna bill us. So one of the treasures from each of the tribes is gonna be getting the the bill. So. Go ahead, Mr. Eagle Bear. Oh, yeah. Pilumia, Pelo, Pele, Ampetu, and we are trophy now. Yeah, let's talk about a key up in Kant, Wokafner, and a war of Lazar, Iwatuelo. I want to thank uh, the public. That's why I came to listen to our tribal members who are living in the city. You know, it's a big undertaking for them to, to come here and try to make a living. And then they're running into problems with health. You know, we face that on our back at home with our Indian Health Service. And I come to listen to them. You know, I, I, I was at the table here a few years ago and I, I have issue, you know, with the way things turned out uh, you know, we are the Oteti Shakoi, or at least right now we have six, six of our bands, you know, all we're missing is the Hunk Papa, and we have the Oteti Shakoi of the Titwa. You know, we can make some good decisions, and we should. And I really feel that, and I'm, I'm, 
I had a young man over here mention my name. I, uh, I think uh, I, I'm really impressed with a lot of our young people stepping up to the plate and taking on the responsibility of leadership. You know, I've been there for 20 some odd years now, and I, I think it's time for me to, but anyway, did you guys hear about these two Oglalas that were sitting alone in the <laughs> No, I just had to throw that in. But I was, every time my name's mentioned at home, I, I always like to respond. And uh, I, I know Shirley, uh, alluded to the fact that, you know, back in the uh, 80s, you know, we didn't have travel money, you know, to fly into DC like we do today on a regular basis. Uh, we had to drive. And then we had to look for places to stay. And fortunately, she put us up. And that was my first uh, experience in uh, having a uh, a cooked in a microwave. She did it. She cooked us breakfast in like two minutes. But I always remember that, you know. And then she ha she had this uh, big townhouse, you know, just a uh, big narrow building, uh, really nice. But anyway, um, you know, we went out there, and at that time we secured a uh, crisis center shelter for our people. And that is still in existence today. And, and so we're very fortunate that, you know, over the years we experienced many things. But I'm really, you know, again, going back to all those percentages, this share, this share, you know, we need to get away from that thinking you know, we have a request submitted to us by this group. Uh, you know, we pulled out. And there are some legal issues pending, mind you. And I don't want to go down that road, nor do they. You know, we're Oteti Shakoi. There's nothing wrong in sitting in a room like this and uh, listen to Bryce all day long. No, I'm just teasing. We should get no, together. Rich in my name, I know. Yeah. <laughs> when we get together, we can problem. Let's fix it. We need to move forward. But I did make a statement, you know, the, the other day, when you're looking at Biden's uh, recovery plan. You know, the Indian Health Service and the BIA are, are going to come up with some big bucks. You know what's gonna you know what they're gonna do, right? They're gonna pick it through from the time it leaves DC and by the time it comes to us we get that nickel or even that penny. We we cannot allow that to happen. Just the other day I had some elders calling me from Rosebud saying, you know what they're they're denying us uh, they're denying to refer us out. So they're stuck at Indian Health Service. That's unacceptable to me. And I said, I'm going to find out. And if this is the case, I said, all you people gather, we'll go march in front of our Indian Health Service. Because you need to get people like Deb Holland to take notice about Indian country. That's the person that should be here to me. Unfortunately, Driven Hawk is a tribal member of ours. But when Driven Hawk and Weaki were here and they were they had their hands in all this transfer, we didn't care for that. But I, I really need to remind us that, that we are Oteti Shakoi of the Tithuan. Right now, we have other tribes governing us. You know, the Great Plain Tribal Chairman's Organization. And some of them are another. And, and, you know, we don't know how they operate, how they live. 
But we are Oteti Shakoi, and I think we should start thinking like that, to going back, going back to identify who we are and to be able to make decisions together in an honorable way. You know, we can do those kind of things. I hope that we don't split off and go back into our own reservations and forget about our people here and their health care. I don't want to go home and forget about a request that was submitted to us. Ask, ask the other two tribes to pull back like Rosewood did. Those are things that we need, they want answers to. They say that they're gonna, they're, they're in litigation in court. I don't wanna go that route. Again, you know, it's an eye opener. But being able to come here and just listen to some of the issues that our people are facing here in Rapid City. You know, you wanna help, you wanna do something. That's how I felt sitting here listening. Had a elder, you know, paperwork, three places, don't know where to go. That's unacceptable. It shouldn't be like that. So I really commend all the people who live here and came here and, and talk to us. You know, re regardless if they're disgruntled employees, they are still tribal people and I will listen to them. So thank you, Apilama Apilo, and I'll tell that joke to you guys later about these two glalas that were sitting along the road. Thank you, Mr. It, it, it also involved a, a mini too, so. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Higobert. You know, we, we have these uh, prizes over here for raffle, but we just decided we're gonna give an award away to the long-winded person out of the three tribes and the running is you, Mr. Carlo, and Mr. In the Woods. So we need to take a vote. Um, our last uh, representative who wanted the floor was Mr. Frederick. Uh, my name is uh, Wayne Frederick, Oak Creek Council representative and health board representative for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. This is my second term, but my first term was 2014 to 17. Now it's 2023. 20, you know, I'll take only about 45 more minutes, but no, I really, you know, I wanna to to say thank you from the bottom of my heart from these people that are holding it down up here in the Aesapa. You know, it's really hard for you guys, for any individual, to talk about the hard times that they're going through, especially with healthcare. We see it as a treaty, right? Uh, IHS has diminished it down to PHS or they throw some HHS, they throw something else at it just to take it away from us, little bits at a time. But six years ago, <clears throat> I was very much in favor of, of uh, being involved with this uh, compact. You know, I think we're the only ones that know how to fix it because we're the ones that have to deal with it all the time. And a lot of these things that we heard today, they're going on at home tenfold, you know? And that's not how it's supposed to be. Uh, bills not being paid, you know, people getting sent out and don't know where to go. It's really, it's, it's saddening because we're the ones doing it now. Gerilyn, we were supposed to be fixing this, not mirroring it. And it looks like we're mirroring it. So you need to fix it, or you need to tell us a corrective action plan on how to fix it. <clears throat> we're tribal legislators elected by the people. We're on the same level as Thune, as Rounds, same level, nation to nation. We're all here at the table. Now we need an action plan. And it kind of got a laugh, you know, well, we'll invite Biden, you know. <laughs> we can, 
He's made broad statements like that, that he wants to meet with the Sioux Nation, you know? Let him meet with us. Let's go meet him. We can do it. Because the times I went to D.C., you see tribes like Navajo Nation. They don't argue about White Owl or, or what, what other little tribal um, village they got, you know? They go there as a nation, and they tell them what they want. And that's what we need to do. Minikoju, Oglala, Sichangu, Dakotas, all of them. Let's go there and demand what we need. But we need to be able to tell them what we need so they don't give us that lip service and say, well, we'll just throw a couple more million at you per, per hospital. Five years, six years ago, when our hospital was in total disarray, <laughs> the CEO last week came and gave us a report. Two more doctors. CMS's report said that Rosebud per capita is supposed to have literally 50 doctors five nurses and we have 10 10 doctors and 30 nurses and all we did was i mean all we did the only doctors that were added those two and then the other uh, four that are interim that are on a rotational basis that lady back there our health administration director and other ones that were on the council for the last three years brought in the boston doctors <laughs> i just didn't do that so once again, we're having to solve some of our problems. But up here, we were supposed to be, this was supposed to be the, the um, literally the, the thing that we all wanted to have set up exactly like that on our uh, IHS facilities on our reservations. This was supposed to be the, the literal, I don't know what you'd call it, you know, the, the piece for, for all of us to, follow but it's turning out that it looks like we're mirroring so you know you need to get with us or something and you need to help us out you need to fix it these people can't be hurting there's only a couple thousand up here but uh, let's not forget it we're a nation everybody let's get together and let's go to DC if we have to if they don't show up here we go there and when we go there, <laughs> I sure hope I can count on uh, my wild Ogallalas, you know? See, Changu's are here, so we're going to lead. <laughs> we're going to help you, you know? So uh, I just want to say that much, and thank you all for uh, bringing forth all these issues, because we're the only ones that can fix it. That's why we started it. Mr. Chair, I'd like to just say to um, the delegation, out of respect, I'd like you to look at my leg sheet, Harold Salloway. I mean, he brought Clinton to us. We didn't go to Clinton, and you can do it too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. So Chair, Mr. Chair, I would just like to leave a, a thought and a suggestion for you as the three tribes, we thought about Chetishchenko we, but also there is the people here in Rap Rapid City in Canada who are refugees, the Hupatla people, the Wazaza. We are those people. We come from, if you read, you will find that we come from the Osage. We come from Sichago. Sichago and also the Oglala. In Crow Creek, where they were there, you read about the history. We are still refugees in our own, in the Black Hills. I propose you suggest that together and think about that, because we were promised a reservation in the Black Hills a hundred miles square. If President Trump can make new reservations and have the, those with or Washichu people oriented, that that law is still in place. We need to bring back so that our refugees 
in Rapid City can have their own district. I want you to think about that. It's powerful. You will be a part of it in bringing back something that happened that never was forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to go ahead. I just want to ask, are, are we meeting tomorrow? Okay. Yes. Um, for for us here at Rosebud, we've been in the dark for a long time, and we're going to depend upon you guys and you guys to tell us how it's been going. Are you satisfied with the reports? Are you getting the information you need? Because we want to come join, but we're in the dark. So I'm, I'm glad we're meeting tomorrow. Thanks. So we're trying to discuss the time, and they said to allow you guys to be here on time. We'll start at one. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Um, so I want to, uh, you know, we're going to meet tomorrow, the Tuni tribes again here, uh, 10 o'clock. We'll go a little bit later than um, this me and Mr. Carlo from our tribe. We're here at eight this morning. So, you know, uh, we'll give, we'll, we'll give a little bit of time for others to get here. Um, go, go ahead. I just wanted to add something to make sure Driving Hawk won't uh, back out because, you know, we are in court with him. And I talked to the other petitioners, and if, if you are able to get Driving Hawk to come, this is so he can't use us as an excuse why he won't come, that we will stay away from your meeting. If you get Driving Hawk here, fine, then you can meet with him. We will stay away. We're going to talk to our lawyer and see if we have to do that but so that he won't have any excuse not to show up. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Whiteface. So we'll, we'll have closing remark, remarks by our two chairmen who are present here. We'll start with Mr. Bordeaux first. Yeah, again, I wanna thank you uh, for bringing us together. Uh, I guess I need to know from both of you, Trav, if you want Rosewood back at the table. I think this is kind of what we're kind of exploring here. Um, Ryman, yeah. So we can consider that. I know it's it's been a, a tough go here, but um, it's better if we work together. You know, Mike, I know Mike suggested that. So it's all, from what I'm getting here, that we, we should all come back. I mean, Rose would come back and join you. So we'll, we'll prepare for that. And it's up to the council. The two ladies are kind of looking at me kind of tough, so I better watch out. So, no, I think uh, we'll uh, deliberate next week and then we, we can make a decision soon. But yeah, we'll be, uh, yeah, I really want, I think we can do a lot, achieve a lot, you know, with being together and working with Mr. Keller, you know, I'm glad and congratulations on uh, your election and been able to touch base with you, but I imagine it's pretty wild for you right now, getting used to your job. But anyway, uh, we're here though. Still. Thank you, Mr. Bordeaux. President Killer. Uh, cool. uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Jumping Eagle, for your leadership today and putting this together. And uh, thank you to our respective uh, our, our brothers, you know, brother tribes and stuff, uh, Rosebud and, and uh, Shine River. You know, thank you for showing up, coming here today, uh, and just being, uh, you know, just, just hearing out the issues. You know, I think that's one of the things of, again, of being a, a good relative. And, uh, you know, going back to that is that, you know, our our uh, ancestors prayed for this to happen. You know, it, it just doesn't happen by happenstance. It, it uh, It's really important that we continue to come and work together because, you know, as as like, I think Councilwoman Juan was, was saying that uh, this is a really unique time and it's been referenced a couple of times. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Eagle Bear or Bear Eagle, sorry, Bear Eagle uh, mentioned that, you know, uh, that you know, we have a really unique time right now to just meet together, put things on the table and just, uh, you know, do, do uh, you know, get our, get what we need. You know, I mean, this is like one of the few, I was telling Chairman Bordeaux, this was a few times that tribes had this much attention ever in their history, you know, that I know of, um, that, you know, they just like want our needs, want our, you know, want everything that we need. And, uh, you know, if we can come in together in a unified front, you know, especially holding people accountable 
and also uh, you know coming coming and showing ways to work together. I think it's really important that we take advantage of that. So um, as I'm not sure if you're in the, the room, uh, Chairman Bordeaux, but there was a motion to make that was made by our council to uh, demand uh, Mr. Driving Hawk come to the next meeting. And uh, we'll, you know, hopefully we'll sign on as joint joint joint, joint chairs, uh, yourself, um, uh, Chairman Frazier and myself, and we could uh, sign, get that letter over to them. Um, and and I'll we'll, we'll have our attorneys draft that so we can send it over to you. And the other thing is that we'll send out another invite from the HHS committee to all the council uh, for that meeting date next week, or I think it was next week, and uh, definitely follow up on that. So again, thank you to all of our members up here as well uh, for, for doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, it is, you know, we do have to be accountable. We have to sit through these kind of things. So, you know, I have tough skin. You know, my dad raised me, he, you know, he was kind of crazy. Um, so I'm used to being yelled at. So I, you know, it's not not a big thing to me, you know. So I'm like, okay, well, if you get an ass chewing for my dad, then you know, you guys would be a lot different. So you know, so that's that's the one thing that you know I don't think a lot of people know about me is that my dad, you know, raised me as a military person, really. So you know, but anyway, with that being said, thank you again, uh, Chairman, for all of your leadership today, and uh, HHS committee. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, thank you, Ms. Church, for all your leadership and uh, just look forward to seeing the next steps and seeing how we can move forward together in a good way. We'll be with HGO. Thank you. So I'll call us into recess at 536. Um, the, the, the ladies want to do a, a couple quick drawings before we close and after the drawings we'll have Mr. Salway um, give us a closing prayer. So go ahead. Okay, um, the first ticket will be um, 469121. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody. Okay, so the next number will be 469152. Okay. Keep going, Val. The next number is four six nine one seven six. Four six nine one seven six. Okay, the Next number is four six nine one two five. Okay, uh, four six nine one nine zero. Okay, uh, four six nine one seven nine. Okay, one oh wait, four six nine one eight five. Can you raise your hand if you, if you call your number? Okay, four six nine one two eight. Okay, four six nine one six seven. Four six nine one six seven. Barb, shake your uh, jar again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, four six nine one zero eight. Okay, four six nine one one one. 
Oglala said that the grand prize tonight is a picture with Christy Nome. Okay, 